explained, they would be very effective against satellites. But of course, they're also composed of satellites. And so they'd be extremely effective against each other and vulnerable to each other. And the minute both the United States and the Soviet Union had Star Wars weapons in space, whoever fired the first shot could disable the system of the other side at the speed of light, clearing the way for their own missiles in an unopposed first strike, but retaining their own so-called shield to protect them from retaliation. If anybody convinces you that Star Wars weapons just might shoot down ballistic missiles, then you've got to accept the fact that it would make a first strike much easier. There is not a single scenario that anyone has dreamed up in which the existence of Star Wars weapons makes a first strike more difficult. And because of the enormous way these weapons reward whoever shoots first, their deployment by both sides probably guarantees nuclear war. So what's the alternative? Well, clearly the only alternative is to make sure nobody gets Star Wars. Now, that's easy. We could do that. The treaties have been worked on. The Soviets have agreed to whatever verification means are necessary, including inspection of everything put into space before it goes out there. Radiation detectors, x-rays, CAT scans, visual inspection, inspection on the launch pad, inspection to prior to mating. The Soviets have already agreed to all of that as a means to keep weapons out of space. Now this is what we're supposed to be doing in Geneva, is negotiating this thing. The agreed position, the agreed purpose of those Geneva negotiations is to prevent an arms race in space and end the arms race on Earth. That's not what we've been doing. We could have finished that job in Reykjavik at the mini-summit. We could have finished it in December in Washington. But we didn't. But I haven't given up on President Reagan. I sent him a copy of my book, hot off the press. <laughs> Just to make sure, I also sent one to Nancy. We could just convince the president that this is not a peace shield, you know, or a, or a crayon rainbow. <laughs> but weapons that shoot and destroy and imperil our survival just as it does that of the Soviet Union. If he could understand that, he could cash in the Star Wars bargaining chip while it still has some value and he could end the arms race. He could get a giant step toward disarmament for really the first time in history. He could do for our relations with the Soviet Union what President Nixon did for China. And he'd go down in history as one of the world's greatest peacemakers. And I'd like to see him do it. But of course there's a chance he won't. <laughs> there are still a few of those same advisors around him. Well, we've gotten rid of some of them. But there are still a few of those lunatic advisors around him telling him to hang tough on Star Wars at all costs. And if he does, then it's up to us. Fortunately, in this democracy of ours, the president is not the ultimate authority. He has to get his money from Congress. And Congress works for us. Through our elected representatives in Congress of both parties, and by the way, you've got some of the best right here in Iowa, what, the first congressman to sign on with me way back in 81 to fight this stuff, 82, was Jim Leach. And I've got uh, the first two senators to help me were Mac Mathias and Mark Hatfield, both Republicans. And now more and more have signed on. We've got a big bipartisan support for trying to keep this in check. And through our elected representatives in Congress, if we give them the support, we can grab a hold of the purse stings and deny them money to test these weapons in space, and we can preserve the ABM treaty. And while we're at it, having witnessed a year and a half long unilateral Soviet moratorium end because we wouldn't cooperate, I think we ought to deny them any money for nuclear testing whatsoever. There is
is no longer any excuse for nuclear testing. They're all totally and absolutely false. Now, with actions like those, through our Congress, we can hang in there. Regardless of whom the president chooses to listen to, and we can give some future president the opportunity to end the arms race. And I'm confident one day she will. And what I'd like to do now is to briefly address the question, if Star Wars isn't the answer, what is? Because it's not a new weapon. There is not going to be a new super weapon that's going to magically make us safe and secure in Fortress America. And we're going to have to do it the hard way, the way we always have. We have to do it with real preparedness, with negotiations, with diplomacy, with realism, with goodwill. You know, we, another thing. I'm not sure that all those weapons ever really have been the thing that provided our security. In biblical times, people used to make idols out of gold and silver and brass and bronze. Well, today we make them out of uranium, plutonium, titanium, and steel, but they're idols nonetheless. We've been worshiping the bomb, put all our faith and trust in the weapons we manufacture with our own hands. It's not the source of our security. Now they've got a new idol for us to worship. Don't buy it. Just say no. <laughs> now I think we have to remember that if we want to be a great nation, we first have to be a good nation. We should look to our priorities and the use of our resources. We should ask ourselves what we could be doing instead of Star Wars. Now, first of all, of course, there's a lot we could be doing for real military security. The people in uniform are not benefiting from all of this high-tech gadgetry. They've been denied cost of living allowances. Their families have been denied decent medical care and dental care. They're told there's not enough doctors. They can't handle them. They've been, had their benefits chipped away little by little. They don't have the logistics to support them. They don't have weapons that work if they ever really had to use any. They've got stuff like the M1 tank and the Bradley fighting vehicle and the DIVAD Sergeant York air defense gun and the B-1 bomber. For goodness sakes, you know, that's not security. Well, what else could we do? Well, with the same scientists, the same engineers, and the same industrial capacity that they want to use for Star Wars, we could have a global air traffic control system in space. A global weather forecasting system that in one year would double the rice production of India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. A global pollution monitoring system tracking the ravages of air pollution, water pollution, acid rain, deforestation, the hole in the ozone layer. A global disaster warning system. A global water and mineral resource exploration system. Vastly improved global telecommunication systems bringing the benefits of telemedicine educational television, and entertainment to the third world. And of course, maybe even a global system for verifying arms control agreements and monitoring things in the world. A, a jointly manned military command post in space where US and Soviet officers would watch what's going on in the world and if some madman somewhere in a third nation got a hold of a nuclear bomb and exploded it somewhere, they'd be able to each tell their countries, hey, they didn't do it and we didn't do it. Uh, and that might make the difference in time of crisis. And what could we do with the rest of the money? Well, with one year's increase in the defense budget under this administration, just the increase, we could provide food, clothing, shelter, education, and medical care 
to every child in Latin America, Africa, India, the Pacific Basin, every needy child in the world, I think that would do more for our security than the added weapons we could buy. What we need is not a new weapon, but a new way of thinking. Now, I'm sure you've heard that phrase. You probably heard it from Mikhail Gorbachev. He came over here from the Soviet Union talking about new way of thinking. But I'll tell you, it didn't originate over there. Like a few other things they take claim for, you know. It didn't start over there. It started right here. It started with Albert Einstein. At the dawn of the nuclear age, he warned us that we were doomed unless we adopted a new way of thinking. And it has been preserved and passed on by organizations like Beyond War, the Physicians for Social Responsibility. These organizations have not only preached the new way of thinking here in this country, but they've taken it around the world, including to the Soviet Union, and preached it to their counterparts over there. I've had some part of that, too. Several years ago, before Gorbachev, I went to Moscow as a technical advisor to a U.S. delegation to an international conference on space weapons. And at the end of the conference, I was asked by the U.S. delegation to make the closing statement at the press conference. And I used it to try and get across this new way of thinking to the Soviet leadership and through their media to their people. Now we hear this new way of thinking coming back. The problem today is to get it to Washington. You here in Iowa have a big part in that because you're going to select the people who have that fast road to the White House. The choice is really yours more than anyone else's. But since I wrote this speech for the Soviets, I would like you to just play Russians for a couple of minutes while I conclude with an excerpt from my speech to you, the Soviet people. As a career military man, I've devoted my life to the security of my country. But in this nuclear age, it's become clear that there is no longer any such thing as national security. There is only common security. Many in my country are genuinely afraid of you and the Soviet Union. And in their fear, they want to retreat to a fortress America. They want to build a marginal line in the sky to protect them from nuclear annihilation. It's an understandable desire, but it is an illusion. Such systems, being researched in both our countries, can protect neither. They can only ignite a new costly round in the arms race and increase the danger that war will occur. If nuclear war occurs, it will matter little who started it, who is better defended, or who gets in the most blows. The likelihood is that all nations will be destroyed even those who do not participate. What I'm continually telling my countrymen is that our real enemy is not you in the Soviet Union, but nuclear war itself. And the cause of such a war, if it comes, will not be greed or anger or malice. It will be fear, fear that both of us are causing. And in my lectures to military and government leaders, I tell them it is no longer possible for us to guarantee the security of the United States, unless at the same time we guarantee the security of the Soviet Union. If we allow your existence to be threatened, war will occur and we will be destroyed. Our survival is in your hands, just as yours is in ours. Like it or not, together we bear the responsibility for the survival of all the other nations of the earth. It's the lack of understanding of those simple facts that underlies our dismal failure at arms control. We approach it as adversaries, as if it were a game in which one side wins and the other loses. It is not. Rather, we must approach it as partners attempting to solve a common problem, for that is the reality. Together, we must succeed in ending the arms race, or together we will surely perish. Now with space weapons, we still have a choice, and we are a planetary people. Together we can prevail in the hostile environment of space and through it better our life on Earth. Or we can export our instruments of death beyond the planet entrusted to us by God 
and thereby destroy it. My brothers and sisters, let us choose life. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I've got some free things for the people who are, have to leave. You stop by the, the table over there. Can we have those three by five cards distributed now? Uh, let me tell you what they're for. This is space and security news. The current issue is on the table back there, and you're welcome to take a copy as you leave. It's a 20, 24 page uh, newsletter, a uh, couple of pages of cartoons and whatnot. Anyway, to provide an independent voice to the American people on such issues. If uh, you're interested, please pick one up. If you would like a free subscription to Space and Security News, just print your name and permanent address on one of these 3 by 5 cards and drop it on the table back there as you go out. Please don't use a dorm or a, an apartment or something that you're in temporarily. If you're a student, uh, you can use your, your parents' home address but if you give me a permanent address, I'll be happy to give you a, a subscription to Space and Security News. We also have back there some copies of my book, Star Wars Defense or Death Star. We don't have enough of these to just give them to everybody, but we do give them to all our contributors. And afterwards, I'll be back there autographing copies for those who would like to make a contribution to the work of our institute. It's all tax deductible. Uh, what's in here is the kind of information that was in my lecture, plus a whole lot more the whole history of the arms race in space back to the 1950s, all about anti-satellite weapons as well as Star Wars, a uh, chapter on space weapons and arms control, chapter on the civilian space programs we could be doing instead. I mentioned some in my talk, uh, a chapter on alternative futures where I propose 10 steps to get out from under mutual assured destruction without buying into something even worse. There's, for those who are interested uh, in the Appendices, a chapter on laser battle station design, a technical analysis of the High Frontier proposal, the full text of the ABM treaty protocols and agreed statements, text of President Reagan's Star Wars speech, dialogue between me and General Abramson on countermeasures and other things. Anyway, if you're interested, I'll be back there autographing copies of this. If you can't wait, you can just get one back there and leave a contribution. We suggest a donation of $20, but we'll take whatever you want to give. I know students, you may not be able to afford that, Whatever you'd like to give, 10, 100, it's all right. <laughs> As you can imagine, we don't get any uh, funding from government or industry. And uh, now, uh, if you can just take whatever contributions come in back there for me uh, for the book and hand them one and whatnot. Oh, I'm ready for your questions. Thanks for the commercial. Of what? They not only speak different language, they are culturally different. They always live in the police state. They are thinking different. They make you treat to vodka when you go over there and the pali pali. You haven't been there for a while, have you? <laughs> you haven't been there for a while, have you? Uh, I lived too close for too many years. Yeah. Now the. the uh, is, but uh, what's the? What does that have to do with this? Marginal line. Marginal line was also broken through at Dijon, at the south end near the Swiss. Yeah, but it, they didn't have and to get through it. Went through and broke the whole southern French arc. That's just to be accurate. But I, I didn't say they didn't go through it. I said he didn't have to. He went around it. Well, yeah. but the, you and the, the, you know, the fact is that that uh, you know, your, your analogy is pretty good because if we think that the Russians are going to just send ICBMs through space where we can 
take pot shots at them, uh, then, uh, you know, and, and not have submarines off our coast pumping things in at low level or whatever, then we're doing that same kind of silly thinking. And the fact is that uh, uh, the Soviets are liable to exploit any number of ways of uh, getting nuclear weapons to their targets, including bringing them in in diplomatic pouches. Uh, we cannot just assume that they're going to follow the traditional way of doing things. And that's precisely why uh, one of many, many reasons why Star Wars is absolutely no good as a defense. Well, it's just a depressing moment. You require... I mean, accuracy required may overcome somebody who is using advocate still. Hmm? Did we control satellites that are years away from us in light light? Mm -hmm. And we can control them. That's right. Accuracy, it's, it's not. It's what? It's not a very difficult thing to overcome, the accuracy. But maybe uh, if we think about these things, we don't need to have seven mirrors. We don't need this complicated thing. Someday, uh, somebody will strike on a simpler measure. Whether well, it's necessary, I don't question. If we were doing basic research like we used to be doing in order to look for a new technology unknown like a ma uh, electromagnetic force field that would disable nuclear weapons as they went through it regardless of what they were delivered in, yeah, maybe we would find something. But we're not even looking. It's not that we don't know that such things exist or that we doubt that they exist. We're not even looking for them. We are taking technologies that we have explored for years and we already know cannot possibly do that mission and we're simply building weapons out of them because we've got other things for them, other uses for them. Well, that's chapter six in my book. <laughs> But uh, it starts by a mutual recognition of our vulnerability. That's the, the first step. Uh, once we've done that, uh, maintenance of deterrence. Uh, I think most of us accept that for a limited amount of time, we can maintain stability with deterrence as we back down and go through the disarmament process. And by the way, the military have to be brought into this. It can't be done by the politicos. You've got to get military advisors getting access to the people that make the decisions. And that hasn't been happening in the last seven years. Uh, and because it's not just a numbers game. Uh, it, it's not just, we have so many nukes, you have so many nukes. The kind of weapon makes all the difference. The important thing and why you need the military advisors, you've got to make sure that at every point in the process, you don't reward the person that shoots first, the aggressor. You see, I'm not saying that the United States is the evil empire. I am saying it is profoundly stupid for us to be developing weapons that are only of use to an evil empire. That's what I'm saying. Once you've done that, maintenance of deterrence, recognition of mutual vulnerability, enhancement of stability. That can be done, for example, by eliminating the MIRVs, as one example. The reduction of the threat, reduce the threat that we pose to each other. Part of that, for example, will be getting rid of three Soviet tanks in Europe for every one of ours and so forth. We outnumber them in a lot of things. We're going to have to make various balances, but it's going to be unequal, and they recognize that. Yes? For instance, how can supposedly our tanks are technologically superior? Yes, they are, and much more modern. <laughs> Ex except for our newest one, there's some question whether it'll work at all when it's really needed. Yeah. Anyway, there's a lot of discussion on either side of which is better quality yeah. or quantity in weapon systems. Yeah. Uh, and even we can't really discern who would win, although we assume that's right. would win. That's and a good. What I'm saying is. It's a good situation where both sides are in doubt of what the outcome would be. That's a very good situation. Nobody's going to start anything unless they've got a pretty good idea they might win. What I mean is how can you justify a reduction of 3 to 1 in tank forces in Europe if no one can really tell what the outcome is already? Well, because at the same time that we get the Soviets to reduce three times as many tanks as we do, they're probably going to ask that uh, we make uh, 
larger reductions in some of our fighter bombers, uh, in some of our other kinds of weapons. Uh, the manpower reductions will be pretty much uh, symmetrical because we outnumber them in troops in Europe, but only marginally, only very marginally. Uh, first thing they're going to argue, of course, is that uh, most of their tanks are in storage far behind the lines. It would take them two weeks probably to get them to the front. Uh, and so they're no use in an aggressive offensive capacity. You know, we'd see everything happening and all of that. There are a lot of arguments on both sides. The, the fact is that uh, neither side is in a position to be the aggressor at the moment. That's, we've designed it that way. And, and that's the purpose of all the negotiations, is so that we don't award, reward the aggressor. There's a lot of talk about first strike. Neither of us is anywhere near the capability of a first strike right now. And that's by design. Now, we happen to be a lot closer to it than the Russians, uh, because we have uh, uh, far more forces that, are, uh, that can be used in a first strike, and they're 10 times as vulnerable to a first strike as we do. We have 10 times as many survivable strategic nuclear weapons that can't be targeted in a first strike. Uh, I mean, the balance is something that is very complicated, and you have to get the two militaries sitting down together with goodwill on both sides trying to, uh, to come to agreements that maintain stability. It can be done. So you agree that we are stable now without, without an FBI? Oh, yes. Yes, I do. I'm, you know, there's a lot of people going around saying, gee, we're going to have a nuclear war any day. I don't believe that. If we're stable now, why would we use nuclear weapons? Well, I would rather we didn't. Than, than build up, you know. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, if we had a nuclear freeze, that would be a huge relief. Or get rid of nuclear testing, end it now. So n neither side could build new nuclear weapons. Then if we never threw a nuclear weapon away, over a period of time, both sides would lose confidence that they'd ever work. Eventually, we'll scrap them all anyway. Yes, but if you scrap the nuclear weapons, that's going to change your balance in some way or another. Of course, and that's why while you go through this process of disarmament, you also have to bring the conventional forces in. That's why taking the tank balance, the anti-tank balance, and all those other things into account is just as important as the nuclear weapons. Because we don't want to get rid of nuclear weapons just to make the world safe for a repeat of World War II. We don't want that. And I can also guarantee you, neither do the Russians. OK, so anyway, after we do that, then the maintenance of security, uh, new kinds of systems to provide security for both sides. Uh, growth of interdependence, economic interdependence, uh, that's already happening. Uh, I mean, if they nuke us, where are they going to get their wheat? I mean, all of those things are good. Uh, diminishing of the differences. Uh, we have different kinds of human rights in the two countries. We emphasize political rights. They emphasize economic rights. We used to talk in this country of liberty and justice for all. We've got all the liberty, and they've got all the justice. Both sides have to change, so we've both got a little of it, of all of it, because they're both important. We in this country have essentially uh, canned economic justice, at least for the last seven years. Uh, we've not wanted any part of it. And uh, we talk a lot about you know, freedom, but we only mean certain freedoms. Uh, we, we've forgotten half of Roosevelt's message you know, it just wasn't freedom from fear, freedom of religion, freedom of press. He talked about freedom from want as well. And uh, so we have to uh, improve both societies to decrease our differences. Uh, the establishment of law. Eventually, the final step is what I call the development of friendship. Uh, it, it's something you may think that's naive. I don't. Uh, there were people that a few years ago uh, kept pointing to the Chinese, the yellow peril, as a greater threat than the Soviets. Now we call them our friends. Uh, a few years earlier than that, and I can still remember it, our greatest enemies were the Japanese and the Germans. And although they may be a, a big threat to us now from an economic point of view, uh, they're our closest allies. Um, and of course, historically, our greatest historical enemy, the country we fought more wars against than any other, is Great Britain. Now, if someone says that we can never be friends with the Russians, they don't have any vision. They've got a very short view of history. 
Yes. Depends on whether you're talking about the civilians or the military. I get a great deal of support from the military and the Pentagon. I've still got close friends at very high levels in Space Command uh, in Colorado Springs and in the Pentagon in Washington. We in the military have a cherished heritage. We're subject to civilian authority. The problem we've had in the last seven years is that the civilian authority has been far more militaristic than the military. Uh, I am a pariah to people like Casper Weinberger and Richard Pearl, both of whom are out of the Pentagon officially, but still very much around in the wings. Uh, they hate my guts. But I've got a lot of friends in the military still on active duty that support what I'm doing very strongly. They say, we may be muzzled, we can't speak out. There's an absolute gag order on the military. But they say, you know, thank God you retired in time and you can. You can speak for all of us. A lot of friends in the military that support me. Yes. Okay. Did they, uh, do you mind from the FBI office because most of the defense uh, department and now we need to tune into the large corporations that benefit from that money and people are afraid of losing jobs or whatnot with this defense. Uh, and our government doesn't continue as it has for the last 20 or 30 years. So what considerations Okay, right. There are very easy answers to that. Uh, nobody has to lose a job. Now, you, you've got to do a little bit of planning. Uh, and, and a lot of people haven't. When I was an executive at General Dynamics, I used to go to the executive dining room and sit down there and I'd ask my buddies, what are you going to do if peace breaks out? <laughs> yeah, they're totally unprepared for it. <clears throat> I tell you, you don't have to cause any unemployment. Uh, first of all, there are still things that we do need for our security. We still don't have a space-based radar. If somebody shoots a cruise missile at us, whether it's the Russians or Qaddafi or whoever, we'll never see it coming until it explodes. You know, we ought to have that. It's important for us and the Russians to have good early warning systems. One thing, you know, part of this new way of thinking is to understand, for example, that it's just as important to us that the Soviets have good early warning systems and that they're unthreatened by weapons in space. That's just to imp as important to our survival as it is that we have good early warning systems. If the Russians can't see when we're attacking them, then they can't see when we're not attacking them. In a time of crisis, that could be fatal. So we have to take this larger view of what our security is dependent on. It's dependent on the Russians never wanting to attack us or never being panicked into attacking us. So there are some things that will continue to be needed. But there are some other things we could do. I mentioned the civilian space, but more than that, if a president of the United States said next year we're going to have a 60% cut in our weapons procurement budget and a 600% increase in the budget for mass transit. You would be surprised how fast General Dynamics would start designing subway cars. And there needn't be dislocation and disruption. You don't have to lay the guys off. You know, at the same time, I say to the captains of industry, in the transition period, don't throw your guys out on the street. We'll keep the paychecks coming. If you can pay farmers not to grow crops, you can pay engineers not to build weapons. Well, I'm against having to use them, I'll tell you that. 
I mean, this is why most of us are in the military, is because we don't want war. We, you had that corny old uh, thing uh, in, in SAC, peace is our profession. Well, there's a lot of us that believe in that. And most of us in the military understand that the only way we can accomplish our military mission of protecting the people of the United States is by preventing a nuclear war, not causing one and then trying to shield ourselves from its effects. Well, first of all, we use defense to mean everything. We mean it for offense, you know, it's defense department instead of war department, all these kind of things. You know, but what you mean is it's important for us to have a strong military. Oh, I would if I thought we could do it. Uh, now, for example, you know, there's certain things you can and some things you can't. Not all of that is discretionary spending. Now, in this latest issue here uh, of, uh, of our space and security news, we have uh, a thing on the defense budget, which, by the way, amounts to 63% of the total federal budget in real terms. And I've broken it down into the kinds of things that we can't really do anything about, at least not for a long period of time, and those we can. Uh, military pay, retired pay, veterans benefits, the Coast Guard, the interest on the military, debt, a lot of those things that we just can't do anything about. Uh, they can be reduced gradually over a very long period of time. Operation and maintenance, uh, and so forth. But there are things that can be drastically reduced if we have the right environment that they're being reduced in the Soviet Union as well and we do this thing in a planned stable way. And that includes uh, the military part of NASA which has just about destroyed NASA, uh, the CIA, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, you know, the civil defense bunkers and all the uh, evacuation schemes, cities evacuating to each other and all of that garbage. Uh, the draft boards, uh, international military assistance, our arms trade, military construction, nuclear warheads, the Department of Energy's nuclear warhead budget, which is seven billion a year, uh, weapons R&D, which is 34 billion, and weapons procurement, which is 83 billion. Those can be reduced if we have an end to the arms race. We got a man to deal with, Mr. Gorbachev, who wants to end the arms race. Not just because he's a good guy, he wants to do it because he's got his own internal domestic problems. He wants to rebuild their economy, uh, their domestic economy, their consumer goods. And it gives us an opportunity to do the same thing here. And I think we could use a bit of it. Uh, but right behind you, yes. Uh, you're referring to yourself as a military man, are you in active service? No, I'm retired. But if well, I, I was, I was in the army not for my own choice, uh -huh. but I don't consider myself a military man. Well, once you, if you're a career man and you are officially retired, you are subject to recall at the discretion of the president, and you are considered a military man, and you are called by your rank, and uh, I still belong to the officers' club and do all the other things. I still co consider myself a military man. I am subject to recall to active duty if ne necessary. And uh, yes, so, yes, I consider myself a military man, and we're still part of the community. We still socialize with our friends in the military. And if it was necessary, uh, I'd have no objection to risking my life for this country. However, like a lot of my friends on active duty, I've gotten too smart to be hooked into some of the things that we've been hooked into in the past. And I refuse to be a hired killer for the United Fruit Company. And there's a lot of us that if somebody said they want us to go down there and bomb sand and Sandinistas, we'd tell them where to shove it.
Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd advocate zero nuclear weapons, but only if along the way we got rid of enough conventional weapons in a verifiable way that there was no danger of one side or the other hitting the other side with a blitzkrieg, you know, and that can be prevented. You, uh, you do away with the most mobile weapons, you do away with the tanks, you do away with the things that can be, the fighter bombers, you know, we're big in some weapons too. You do away with the things that can reach deep in the other guy's territory quickly and be used in an offensive way. If somebody wants to, you know, build them systems that are truly defensive, waste their money in that way against an attack that isn't going to come, you know, that's sort of up to them. We all know what defensive weapons are. Anti-aircraft, batteries sitting next to a city, able to shoot down enemy aircraft if he comes overhead, or uh, a, a, a shore battery sitting on your coastline, able to shell an enemy warship that comes within your 12-mile limit. Uh, those are defensive weapons, uh, you know. Same thing with the old-fashioned ground-based ABM system. It can't attack anything that hasn't attacked you first. Of course, that's where the, the distinction with Star Wars, because it's not like that. It's not in your territory. It's out there cruising the gro global oceans of space like a battleship able to shoot and destroy other battleships or merchant vessels or passenger liners or anything else. And uh, so you'd have to do some discriminating between what you get rid of and what you keep. But eventually, you ought to have it so that nobody can pose a serious threat to its neighbors. Oh, there's no question that, that as the United States and the Soviet Union goes through this process, once you get to a certain point, and I think it's about when we get rid of the first 80 percent, you have to bring the other countries into it. You have to get rid of the nukes in France and Britain and Israel and everywhere else. And my own assessment is that the most difficult task we're going to face is not going to be with the Soviets. It's getting those nukes away from France and Israel. Yes? Well, now, now, just a minute, you know, Carl Sagan is a friend of mine, and, you know, I understand where you're coming from, but you're, you're I think, a little overreaching. Now, I used to say before, uh, you know, the people in the peace movement were saying, oh, boy, nuclear winter. Now we can throw away the nuclear uh, weapons because if anybody attacked us, nuclear winter would retaliate for us, you know. Isn't nuclear winter a wonderful thing for the peace movement? And, and I warned him, hey, you, you know, you're, you're betting on dead horse. Uh, and, and like Dick Garwin says, nuclear summer ain't so hot either. Uh, what you have to remember is this. There are people in the Pentagon and in the Kremlin who have figured out probably how they think they might be able to deal with nuclear winter. Nuclear winter is not caused by nuclear explosions. It is caused by massive urban fires. As a matter of fact, you're much more likely to have nuclear winter from uh, a laser attack than you are from a nuclear weapons attack. The fact is that uh, we in the United States tend to target nuclear weapons, not cities per se, although the Soviet weapons are so mixed in with a lot of their cities that it wouldn't mat matter much. But we feel, the Pentagon feels, that we can probably take out all the military targets in the Soviet Union without causing massive urban fires. There might be a few, but it wouldn't be the kind that would trigger a nuclear winter. Sim no, well, that's an entirely different subject. Now, you were mentioning nuclear winter. You know, we, okay, well, now wait a minute. The Soviets look at us here and they say, look, we, if we want to hit their ICBMs, we can do that and we won't cause any nuclear winter. Most of them are out there in the Dakotas, and there's nothing to burn. And, you know, they can hit our sub-pins in Seattle. It's too wet to burn. 
You know, I mean, uh, nuclear winter is possible, and the Department of Defense thinks it's possible. But most of the strategic planners also think it can probably also be gotten around, provided there isn't a massive total exchange. The problem is that most of the people who do this planning around and think about Star Wars and superiority and all of this stuff, believe in a limited nuclear war, a controlled exchange. We'll hit you with a few, you hit me with a few and whatnot. Now, if you do this, we'll do that and so forth. 